Your Royal Highness, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to come along today. Uh, I, ha I have to say, I personally am going through a journey, and it's really, really interesting to understand, uh, as a livestock producer, actually the role that our products have to play in a healthy and balanced diet. Today, what I wanted to do in the short time allotted to me is just share with you um, some of the journey that I and our company and fellow farmers are doing to actually rising the challenge to reduce our environmental footprint. If livestock products are to have any role in a future balanced diet, we respect and we understand the responsibility we have to actually improving our environmental footprint to do our part to both the global challenges of climate and of human health. When I look as a, as a farmer, one of the challenges I have is that I don't have the luxury of looking at what I do through a single lens. Uh, today, we can have a conversation about the role of livestock products in human health. Tomorrow, I'll have a conversation about the greenhouse gas emissions that my livestock production uh, creates. The following day, I'll have a conversation about biodiversity. The following day, I'll have a conversation on water quality. And on the last day of the week, I will sit down and have a conversation with my bank manager about <laughs> actually how do I get this to economically square up and then sit down at a Sunday lunch and actually look at my children and my grandchildren and say, what will be left for you? Because most of agriculture still in the British Isles is based around farming families. And for us, we are hurting and we're here to try and rise to our side of the deal. We have to put our house in order. So when I look at the way forward, um, we've already heard from Guy about we need a systems-based approach. The solutions that we're coming up with will deliver multiple public goods and do it simultaneously. Not only tra uh, tra uh, tackling the issue around uh, nutrition and malnutrition, but going right to the core. Without soil and soil health, we have nothing. Without understanding that our soils, our plants, our trees and hedges have another role, and that is they have the ability to take greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere and actually lock them up. And whatever we do, we also have to be mindful that when we actually look at uh, what we do on a landscape, if we do it wrong, the ever more extreme rainfall events we're getting washes it all into the rivers and streams and causes real problem with biodiversity loss in water. And if that isn't enough, we have some real challenges about biodiversity on the research farm that I have the privilege of working in, we have an extra challenge. We inherited one of Ireland's last lowland herds of wild red deer. We also have 40 hectares of ancient Irish woodland. And if you want to understand trade-offs, you try and work out the balance about maintaining Ireland's top mammal and maintaining Ireland's top woodlands, and all the time wanting carbon sequestration as well. So actually, this is not an easy story. It is a complex story. And if that isn't enough, the site that we have our research farm is also a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And when we bought it in 2013, we had seven monuments. Today, we have 13. And we seem to breed monuments as well as we breed red deer. <laughs> but it is a reflection of the approach that we have taken around the systems, about how you look at the totality of what we do as land managers. When I come to focus on, on this last six weeks, I think this is my 26th presentation, um, a little organization in Glasgow, I think, really brought agriculture and climate change to the fore. And certainly, it, I actually and my colleagues have really valued this because it is up, for us, you know, up to us to step into this agenda and engage with concerned citizens and not put our head in the sand. So for us, really, if we want to prove to concerned citizens, and I want to look at my grandchildren, as far as I'm concerned, I need to measure, and then I need to manage, and then I need to measure again, 
I need to be transparent in what I do, and it needs to be credible and verifiable. Currently, my sector is measured on its carbon dioxide it produces from machines and heating buildings, on methane that comes from cows, belts, or from manures, or nitrous oxide that comes from wet soils. And that's what we call gross emissions. And that's currently what the industry is reported on. But we also have a landscape of plants that photosynthesize. They take up carbon dioxide. They lock up carbon. They release oxygen. Yes, cows come and re-eat some of that carbon, re-release it as methane. But some of that carbon gets locked up. If we're going to achieve net zero, we need to reduce our greenhouse gases. But we need to increase what we lock up at the same time. And really, for us, at the core of our journey is doing both simultaneously. To do this, and to do this credibly, for us, it is around this measuring and managing. And so we started this journey in 2014, where we became the first farm in the world to use aerial digital technology to measure every tree, every hedge on our farm. It's a technology called LIDAR. And if you repeat it every five years, you can measure change. So you can get hard data. Has our train left the station? Are we managing more biomass or are we managing less? And after this cycle, we can tell you how much we've done on an annual basis. So we're bringing transparency to our journey. In soils, we've now started to do exactly the same thing. We measure our soils to 30 centimetres, as by the guidelines of the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change, and we measure our soil carbon. We now do this every five years, and we measure change. The beauty about this journey is, for the first time, I now know how much carbon I have got on my farm. I also know, every five years, have I got more or have I got less? And I also have a validated way that I can then tell the world what I'm doing and actually explain it. And when you do this, sometimes you get results that you don't expect. When we did the research on our farm, yes, it's a World Heritage Site, this is actually a naked image of our landscape created by LIDAR. Each circle is a GPS coordinate, computer generated, where we sampled our soils. And we expected our soils to have somewhere between 4 and 5% carbon. We actually only had 2.1%. We didn't see that coming. Why? And that really drove our research agenda. From that then, we actually can divide our carbon stocks in our different grounds. So we've got grazing grounds, we've got woodlands, we've got floodplains, we've got hedgerows. And we can use what we call carbon segregation factors to work out roughly how much carbon we actually lock up on an annual basis. And on our farm, we're at locking up 665 tons of carbon every year, just by the trees, the hedges, and the soils. So having cracked this, we wanted really to start, can we do this with other farms? Is our farm a one-off? So we got support by our Department of Agriculture and Environment in Belfast and from the European Commission's EIP Agri. And seven of us came together to see, could we repeat this again, but on farms with different enterprises, farms of different geographic locations, farms of different soils. We tied up with credible research partners, the Agri-Food Bioscience Institute, uh, AgriSearch, my own company, Devonish, Queen's University Belfast, and the Scottish Rural College. Really credible partners to go on this journey. And when I focus in, and I'm going to focus on one farm just to give you an understanding of the detail we're now going to try and put our house in order and just turn this super tanker around. Um, I want to talk about the farm of Ian McClelland. Ian is a family farm. He's got 60 hectares of land in Ireland. That's a typical size farm. He's got 80 dairy cows, and he runs a good business. So what we've been able to do is we've, we've done this aerial LIDAR survey, and this is his farm map. And you can see every tree and hedge highlighted, and different colors can give you the height of the different trees. And we've been able to measure every one of them, and we see that certainly um, in his trees and hedges, he's 223 tons of carbon. We have then gone and we've looked at the soils. 
We have categorized his soils into different land uses and different land managements. And what we can see when we work this through, that actually he has 6,600 tons of carbon under his soil. So he is looking after very nearly 7,000 tons of carbon, as well as milking 80 cows. And his job is to do both, is to manage both. From there, we took his data, and we went to the Scottish Rural College, and we put it through uh, their life cycle assessment calculator called AgriCalc. And what we worked out then, what were all his emissions from carbon dioxide? And you can see them all listed down. And he is producing 428 ton of greenhouse gas emissions from a CO2. We've then looked at what his cows are emitting, what his manure is emitting, and he's producing another 440 tons. And then we've looked at the nitrous oxide, and he's producing another 251 tons. So in total, on his farm, he, he is producing 1,124 tons. So what we then did is we worked out that on his ground, his trees and hedges are sequestering uh, 297 tonnes. So in total, his net emissions 816. So currently, Ian's footprint is actually 27% below what is currently declared because he doesn't just produce milk. He manages the trees, the hedges and soils in his landscape at the same time. The challenge now is can we get him to do more? And so what we've really looked at on our research farm uh, in Douth and Devonish, we've gone back and looked at soils. And there is an awful story to tell that only 18% of soils in Ireland are at optimal fertility. We've been too busy focusing on animals and not focusing on what they stand on. And the very simple thing is soil pH. Soil pH is critical for the microbiome of the soil where the carbon rests. It is absolutely pH sensitive. So what we found in our farm when we bought it in 2014, our soil pH was awful. So every two years we measure and manage, and we put a little bit more lime on. And now in 2020, we're optimal fertility. And we believe that certainly low pH is one of the key reasons our soil carbon was so low, because we weren't managing the land. And our job is not just about producing food, it is also managing the landscape to which we rest within. The second area, which is really interesting, and we have to uh, admit in livestock production, we have pushed the boat out probably too far. In dairy production, most of us is done with a monoculture of perennial ryegrass, one particular grass. What we've done in this project, we sought funding, we got internationally credible partners, Wagnum University and Research in the Netherlands, University College Dublin, and we're funding five PhD students on one farm, quite unprecedented. And we are now feeding cows a mixture of not just grass, but herbs and legumes. The nitrogen fertilizer has been reduced by 70% because now biology is doing it. We're fixing the nitrogen out of the sky using our legumes. When we put our first year's data through SRUC's AgriCalc, our 12 species sward had a 26% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions per kilo of beef and lamb compared to the perennial ryegrass in one year. And one of the beauties that we find while doing that is not only did we reduce the fertilizer by 25%, the animals loved it. They performed far better. And we had a 300-fold increase in earthworms. And, you know, we have to deliver biodiversity. The earthworm is the king in the soil. And one forgets there's more biodiversity under the soil than above the soil. And so, clearly, we're seeing biological solutions, nature-based solutions, have a real role to play. And just to finish that sweet talk, the area now we are working with, with the Agri-Food and Bioscience Institute in Northern Ireland, is putting animals and trees back together again, as they used to be. This time we've got the science to measure the data. And what we found, the oldest trials in Europe in silver pasture and grazing animals is in Loch Gaul and County Armagh, run by the Agri-Food and Bioscience Institute. And they have found over 30 years 
that they have trebled the carbon sequestration on an annual basis by putting trees and animals together than having just animals and grass on their own. What they've also found when you come to biodiversity, if you look at spiders, birds, beetles, in every case, the silver pasture agroforestry has taught the other two. Most interesting me, as a farmer, one of the problems I have in Ireland is it always rains. We produce a lot of grass and herbage, but we can't always graze it because our ground gets too soft. By actually putting trees and animals together, the trees dry out the land. Ironically, in a drought, they stop the sun getting at the grass. So it works both ways. And what we've seen is our soil trafficability has increased by 17 weeks a year. That's extraordinary because it means we can keep animals outside for longer. That's where they naturally should be. And an animal that's outside produces far less ammonia emissions than an animal inside. And so we see certainly a great room for nature-based solutions. And the last area I want to highlight is there is a considerable R&D pipeline of new and improved uh, uh, technologies coming forward. I borrowed this slide from our Australian partners, the Commonwealth Science and Industry Research Organization Australia. I use it because it actually depicts a collection of different technologies in the pipeline to actually help this sector put its house in order. And along the, uh, up the y-axis, you've got uh, how good these technologies are in reducing methane. Along the x-axis is the barriers to implementation, whether it's a scientific barrier, an economic barrier, and each bubble is a, uh, a, a technology. And down on the bottom right, you can see genetic stereo, that yellow bubble. We know as we improve breeding, we actually do improve milk production and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The big mustard-colored one is work that's been done in New Zealand and now in England around vaccines. The red one, biochar, charcoal, you can feed small amounts of charcoal to a ruminant and it will reduce methane. It just will do nothing for their health. Um, if I go above that, bioactives, things like garlic, citrus, will help to reduce the emissions. You might just get a funny taste in your milk. And probably for me, the two most interesting ones are ones happening in Australia that I want to see over here. Leukema. Leukema is a tree. It's a nitrogen-fixing tree, sadly semi-tropical. So unless I plant it in Cornwall, I don't know if I can do it anywhere else. But interestingly, in silver pasture, it can feed the swords which, you know, that the animals eat. But if you coppice the tree every year and let it regrow, the leaf, when ingested by the cow, reduces methane by 35%. And interesting, the latest research from Queen's University, Belfast, is the good old willow crop looks like might have the same benefit here. And we know we can grow willows. And uh, the top one is the one that is the most sexy one of the lot, and that's asparagopsis, a red macroalgae or seaweed. And certainly in both uh, uh, Queensland and in California, they've now seen methane mitigation of up to 90% with the inclusion of seaweed at 0.5% of the diet. It's still some way off, but what I'm trying to say is, please don't write ruminant agriculture off. It actually, if it gets its house together, if it measures and manages. And my last plea, and I'm sorry I am going to repeat a slide that Judith has already shown. Sorry, Judith. And you've seen this from Judith's earlier presentation. My plea, so you've heard it from Judith, who has spent her career in the supply chain. Now you're going to hear it from me, who is a passionate livestock producer. Please give us smart metrics that allow us to deliver both environmental health and human health together. Currently, we have two totally different metrics that don't talk to each other, and all you do is you confuse us as primary producers, and you confuse consumers. Thank you very much.